Hello there. I hope you are still doing well, that you're still with us and enjoying the content for today. We are continuing with today's edition of SME Sasolf um, Built to Last. Remember, you can hashtag on social media at Sassel SA, hashtag Sassel Built to Last. We'd love to hear your comments and um, what your key takeaways from today have been. And also, we're still continuing to engage on the Slido app, so please jump onto there, share your questions and comments as well. Um, so earlier on, during our mental health conversation, we, gave, we were going to give away prizes, so we had a question that was up for that. Um, and for that, there'll be two coaching sessions um, as a prize to be given away. So two people will run a voucher for a coaching session with Yvette. Um, and then before the break, we had a panel discussion on um, upskilling and upgrading as, a, as an entrepreneur and talking about enabling technologies. And one of the polls that we asked was um, from the in the different enabling technologies, would you be interested in accounting or payroll one, HR or ERP? And so the prize giveaway would be for that, um, you'll be getting a free um, access to an, uh, a system. So the question to answer to win access to a system is, what is an ERP system? And there are three um, options for you to select, that an ERP is a maintenance system for hardware, ERP is a training program for marketing, or ERP is an enterprise resource planning system, um, or that, in, uh, or um, it's an entertainment resource portfolio. So there's those four options. Uh, fastest fingers first to select the correct option, and then those people will be then be selected to win a voucher, and we will find out what kind of um, digital system you need and support you with that particular tool. Uh, jumping into our final session for today, I'm really excited about the next speaker to talk to us around customer centricity, that if you are running a business, if you're growing, even if you're just starting, you really want to think about holistically how you engage with your customers and how you grow with your customers. But also, if you haven't thought about it, what does customer centricity mean to you and what does that look like in your business? So um, help me welcome to the stage Uzipo Skakane, who is from EMZ Advisory. And she's the CEO and founder of EMZ Advisory advisory which provides business and leadership solutions for medium to large corporations that have a national continental and global economic footprint uh, she is a thought leader a global speaker and business strategist and has held positions in industry leading corpor corporations worldwide zippo is also the first black south african to receive an mba from the prestigious stanford university in the usa a dynamic businesswoman and entrepreneur all about breaking barriers. So please let the emojis with the hands, the thumbs up, the smiles, whatever it is, and let us give Zipo a warm welcome to our stage. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that warm and very, very beautiful uh, welcome. Uh, it's really such a great pleasure and also such a privilege uh, to be able to spend the next couple of moments uh, with you. You'll also be able to see on Slido, I've just uh, posted uh, a question that uh, people can engage with as we get started. Um, so my name is uh, Zipo Sikakane, and we'll be spending the next uh, little bit of time together and really thinking and, uh, and talking about the topic of really what does it mean to really be thinking about being client-centric, right? So if you're thinking about the context, if you're thinking about the world that we live in, if you're thinking about where you are now, and also let's be specific in the context of South Africa, what are some of the things that are coming to mind? I think that's something that's important and I think that's something that's critical for us to, 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 to have a conversation, basically. And, uh, and also what's important is to realize that it's critical for all of us to take responsibility. One of the most important things about uh, leading and uh, leading a thriving and succeeding or even struggling organization is that you need to put your customers first. It's your responsibility to think about what are the different ways to make sure that I actually operate in a way that is centric to what success is supposed to be for my customers. Now, the thing that's interesting about customer centricity, right, in general, uh, before I go into just telling you a little bit about myself and who I am, et cetera, I want to sort of call out the, 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 the facts and the, and the elephant in the room. And the big elephant in the room, first of all, is that the, the challenge with, um, with, with client centricity or, or customer centricity in general, a lot of organizations um, claim that it's something that they have, right? They claim that it's something that they do. And, uh, and it's also something that you see, right? A, a lot around in, in strategy. So when I was a much my, my younger self many, many years ago, I was responsible, I was head of uh, customer strategy for one of the biggest retail groups at the time in sub-Saharan Africa. 
They'd been sitting on years of client database, millions, millions worth of data, right? And they never actually utilized it and mined it. And when they started using the customer data, right, the whole objective was to, back then, the word client centricity was actually new. Customer centricity was a new buzzword, right? And everyone was starting to do it. This is when the loyalty programs were uh, getting born, getting launched. Uh, the world was changing and it was different. Now, if you then think, um, you know, maybe a decade or maybe plus from that, the challenge is everyone is saying that they're customer centric, right? They're client centric. It's in what they say, but it hardly ever reflects in what we do, how we do it, how we interact, and also then the different ways that are needed to make sure that there's winning on the other side. Why is it that way? Because the customer remains an illusion, right? It's sort of um, this um, individual, right, that you're very happy to interact with when there's an opportunity and at the end uh, there's a payment that comes through, etc., and everyone moves on. But you forget, a lot of companies forget that um, your organization actually exists today because of your customers. And one of the things that I always say to leaders when they're sitting in the boardroom and they're having all these discussions, right, and really thinking about how do I take my business to the next level, one of the things I say to them is, you know what? You always need to make sure that you have one empty seat. One single empty seat. Why is this important? And it must be at the head of the table. The reason why you need this empty seat, right, is that in our case, let's use this example. Welcome, this is our customer. So that in any discussion, in any conversation, no matter what we are talking about, we start with making sure that we interact with our customer. That will make sure that in any room, in any conversation, your customer is what you put first. And this is very critical. That's where I wanted to start. And so as we begin this conversation, I just wanted to highlight to everyone that welcome. This is our customer. And uh, they'll be present as we're having this conversation together, basically. And then I encourage you to also interact um, using the chat. or so also feel free to uh, interact on any of the social media platforms and really share the insights uh, as we're going through the conversation today. Because it's really important that you share the insights um, with each other, basically. One of the questions that I've posted there um, that uh, like a response to is, um, this thing around, what is the one word that comes to mind? If you then think everything that's happened, right? In the last 18 months or so, I mean, ultimately, the world changed to some extent, right? The word literally changed. So if the world changed, what is the one word that really comes to mind for you when you think about the last 18 months? Now, as that's coming through, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a bit of time just um, telling you a little bit about myself, right, the, the individual, and really uh, giving you a bit of context on my journey and my background, because ultimately, at the end of the day, any of the insights that I'm sharing with you today, right, they're coming from a perspective of uh, global experiences that I've had, and the opportunities I've had to also look at diff business in different lenses, because it's important that even though you're existing in the context uh, of South Africa, Ultimately, we are all operating in a globally interconnected world, right? You may be local, but everything is global. And you saw that, especially in the last couple of months or a year or so. The virtual context just made you realize that if you're not competitive globally, <laughs> you can let it go. And so for me, client centricity at the heart of that is about thinking, how do I make sure that I don't let it go, right? And why is this critical, right? And I want to share a quote by uh, Stan Slab, um, one of the, you know, the fellow experts on the topics of organizational effectiveness and culture, which is something I'm very passionate about. He believes that instead of waiting for a leader, you can believe in. Try this. Become the leader. Become the leader that you can believe in. Let me let that sink in for a second. Instead of waiting for a leader, a lot of us are waiting. We want someone out there. We want someone else to solve our problems. Maybe someone will give me the, the idea that will finally save my organization. Let me tell you now, you need to become the very leader that you need to believe in. And let's talk about what leader that is, right? Because ultimately, that leader needs to think about the different roles and the different ways that, it can, it can, that leader can play in taking their businesses to the next level. Now, 
I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background, and our lovely uh, MC shared some context on that. And I do that in the context of when my name comes up, I mean, in any part of the world that uh, I've been in, I mean, I've had the opportunity in the last 10 or 15 years to travel across um, um, sort of 30, 37 different countries now, uh, and having worked across um, six different continents, okay? So I've seen very, very different, many different parts of the world, because I think it's important to make sure that you open up your mind for what's out there. The words that consistently keep coming up are aligned with this um, quote that I just said, which is, success is having the audacity to really break barriers and think of different ways that you can deliver your goals when there's an ever-evolving external environment. But it's very important, while doing all of that, to stay true to your authentic identity as a leader. Now, let's unpack some of these things, because it's important to, to re relate to some of them. So, as far as um, success goes, right, in the world of business, in the, in the global context that we exist on today, I've had the perspective of being an individual, right, um, who's had the power and the opportunity to, to lead a business, right, through many, many, many different periods uh, over the last couple of years. In a world where uh, people who look a certain way, by the way, very similar to me, they are not the people who thrive, right? Whether you pick the, 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 the card of race, of gender, of age, uh, socioeconomic background, you can call me what is the anomaly in the system, right? Not just in South Africa, in the literally the global context. And when you're an anomaly in the system, people are always thinking, but how do you then break barriers, right? How do you then consistently ensure that you get to that authentic place as a leader? Why am I starting about your authentic place as a leader? Is because there is no ways that your customer is going to believe anything that you say, anything that you bring, if you're not being authentic. The world out there is challenging and asking us to say, but I need to see the real you. I need to understand how can I trust you? If I don't trust you, how will I trust your product? And what is the promise that you're making to me to show that you're actually being authentic? Now for me, why is it important to make sure that you're coming from the right mindset as an individual? Is that Mindset for me is about then realizing that as things are always evolving around us, the reality is that if anything, things changing and things evolving, that's one thing that's never going to change, right? And I mean, I I'm very passionate about uh, the topic of change, business, uh, in the context of business. And for many years, it's something that I've been always calling out and basically saying, but literally change is the only constant. If anything, if you want to be successful, right, and we'll get to what this means, obviously, for, for your business. If you want to be successful, every time something changes outside, right, at a certain speed, if you don't change the speed at which you catch up, whether it's yourself or your organization as an SME, you won't survive, okay? And let's be honest, if you then look at the last 18 months, the ones that survived are the ones that had that ability to be able to be agile and move quickly and make change. The ones we're not able to, they didn't make it, right? They didn't make it. So for me, having been an individual who's navigated different parts of the world, right? So whether it's coming, uh, emerging from uh, humble beginnings in the, in the context of the townships of South Africa, having to be able to transition into the, the, the business world as it's done today, and being able to contrast and navigate different worlds, not just in South Africa, right? But also in the other parts of the world. What you start seeing there is the, is the following, right? When things are changing around you, they will always keep doing that, right? But there's something about being consistent, there's something about being true into the essence that is what you exist for. Now, let me mention two words and then I'll come into the next part. There's two words that come to mind. So one is it's not a coincidence that in the last couple of years, for example, um, everyone is talking agile, right? And now even more so because now it's the real, it's the, it's the real thing. And we're actually helping one of the uh, uh, leading uh, tier two banks in South Africa, my team and I, uh, we're literally helping them now figuring out how do I actually make sure that my organization uh, continues to be agile and successful and figuring out ways of bringing in agile strategies and technologies. But everyone is talking agile um, and trying to use it again as a buzzword. Remember what I said about uh, customer centricity? But they're forgetting something that's important, that being agile it's not necessarily just about the, the technical side of it. There's a mindset shift about how do I become the kind of individual who can actually be agile and consistently so when you need to be able to. But at the same time, alongside uh, agility, 
there's something about authenticity, right? Not necessarily about, um, you know, I don't want to change and I want to stay exactly the same, but there's something about as you're being agile, you need to keep being agile moving towards, but what works for you, right? What's going to help you succeed? What are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to develop? Why is this important in the context of SMEs? This is why. Now, when the last 18 months happened, right, uh, and maybe almost two years now, a lot of people started doubting themselves, right? And when you doubt yourself, that's when you start divorcing your business model. I mean, that's what you start divorcing. Some of the things that your customers came to you for because you're saying maybe it's not working, maybe it's not good enough. Those kind of things kill survival. One of the things I did, right, so in my day-to-day, -day, I work with, um, you know, leaders of multinational corporations, right, so I've got a whole team of consultants and coaches and facilitators, and the whole objective of the organization is they literally, literally working with the leaders to help them be effective, medium to large corporations. Now, what are the main things that we then saw immediately? So, for me, I'll be honest, I mean, we're also definitely affected like everyone, but if I then look between then and now, and looking at the story of continued success, continuously so, one of the big things is one, I fundamentally believe as a leader in a no excuses mindset. So there was never a day or a time or a moment where um, I genuinely believe you should use COVID to be any excuse. Because if you're using COVID as an excuse for anything going wrong in your business, then you're basically saying you shouldn't be in business. That's what you're saying. And so one of the things that's important was challenging yourself, challenging myself, to say, how do you reform? How do you innovate? How do you do things differently? I'm also aware one of the big themes about the conference to date is <laughs> everyone is saying technology, digitize, and we'll get to that. And, but there's also the other side. No, no one talks about this, which is when you're thinking about innovation, people are always thinking about the technology, right? And the reform and all this tech stuff we need to do. But no one is thinking about <laughs> the innovation is actually of the self, right? Because if you don't um, change how you think, right? Um, I mean, I think it's Einstein who says, if you did what you did, you'll get what you got. So if you don't change that, I can tell you now that, again, you're the ones who won't survive and you're the ones who will remain stale. So I'll keep painting these two realities as we think about, but what does it mean for me, right? What does it mean for me in my context as I'm thinking about what is happening in the world um, in general and also what's happening uh, to everyone that's uh, around me, basically? Now, the next thing I want to go to is um, thinking about the current context uh, for SMEs uh, in, in South Africa, basically. So, and I'm going to ask people that they engage in the chats because I know you've had a, a, an inspiring uh, morning, right, with a lot of really powerful experts. So I'm just looking at the chat now as we go. But what I'm going to ask is that people really share what is the thing that comes to mind, right, when they think about the current context of SMEs in South Africa. And before I come to the facts, right, because it's important to then start with South Africa and the SMEs and then go to what does it mean about being a client-centric organization, is that the thing about SMEs is that we are the backbone <laughs> of the success of the South African economy. The backbone. Literally, the economy exists because of us. But at the same time, of course, often last on the list to be prioritized, to be given attention. And part of the backbone, it relates to the volume of, if you think about opportunities, right? If you think about employment opportunities, if you think about the ability to actually innovate and bring new models, I mean, how do you bring a new model in, a, in an organization that already is so big that if you change anything, it takes 15 levels of approval just to get anything done, right? That doesn't work, and it doesn't actually add any value, basically. And so let's talk about the, the context uh, this year, right? Because I think it's important to start from a, a very fact-based uh, in, in discussion, right? So if you're looking at it, and I'll go through some of the stuff, because um, as you're at home, you also able to just read it through as we go through, is that, you know, the, the, basically, if you're looking at the range, right, and stuff, there's a couple of things that the SMEs were most affected. In many ways, as expected, this was not a surprise for anyone. What was surprising about South Africa is the depth, right, in terms of um, not enough support that was available. Now, in South Africa, even before the pandemic, right, we still stood out as one of the countries that needed to provide more support. 
and it was mentioned, um, I don't know if it was mentioned in my bio, that I, spend, I did my MBA at Stanford in the, in, the, in, the, in the United States, and it was in California, right? So in, in Silicon Valley. Now, in Silicon Valley is, um, is literally the heart, right, of global entrepreneurship, literally the heart of global entrepreneurship. And that's where everything happens, right? So if anything, I mean, they inspired me as an individual. So immediately after I let, uh, left there, I, I stayed true to my commitment and my mission, right? And I have, of the last uh, couple years or so, I've actually invested in um, many, many early stage uh, uh, startups in, in different parts of the, the continent, but also now even in other parts of the world. Because I'm genuinely a believer that if you help businesses at an early stage, especially the individuals that are backing good concept, you see really good results, right? And when I then compared the experience there versus when I came back to South Africa, and some of you might remember, I mean, I spent some years um, writing about entrepreneurship and leadership, right, uh, for the Business Times and the Sunday Times. I had a column, and every week I was sharing these insights. And some of the insights that I would be sharing were about the comparison between South Africa and the rest of the world. And what I realized about South Africa is that the, the way in which we're thinking about SMEs, right, is that if you look at the, the context and how they're doing in the Valley and why it's working, there's a far better uh, spirit of collaboration, right, and working with each other and trying to get to success on the other side. Now, let's turn that around. What happens in South Africa, it, it, it's very fragmented, right? Very, very fragmented. What does fragmentation mean? It then means you have a, a perspective where you have that cluster in Western Cape. I think they even call themselves Silicon Cape. Um, you know, where they're trying to drive a certain set of innovations and reform. Then you have the cluster in Johannesburg, right? Which there's a lot of organizations that are existing to trying to help, right? They call them incubators, accelerators, all of this. I mean, there's hundreds of them, right? Um, there's research on that. Hundreds and hundreds, they pop up every single year. But then what happens, and there's other parts of the, the, the country also that had clusters, but what happens is fragmented, right? So it's not, it wasn't connected, it wasn't actually working in any way that, um, that um, was adding any value. And then at the same time, you would find that a lot of organizations also just created those programs just so that they can take the card, right? So what you end up seeing is these uh, small business owners moving from one incubator accelerator to the next, yet the business is not going anywhere. It's not growing, and it's actually not getting to anything that's of value. Then, look at then the challenges. In addition to that, look at some of the challenges that came through, right? So then you've got the problems of riots, right? We had a lot of that, and even more this year. You had the lockdown, right? I mean, I knew after the first lockdown that we're going to be locked down for a while. If anything, if I can share small secrets with you, uh, South Africans, it's very important for South Africans to feel that they're in control. So instead of just saying it will be locked down forever, it will just keep saying now it's a level two, now it's a level three, but it's going to stay for a while. So we, but we'll still feel like we have a level of control. The economy was significantly affected, right? But if you then look at what was different in terms of the response, right, so this time around, there's a couple of things, right? I mean, if you're looking at the private and pu public partnership, there were some really bad examples, but also at the same time, this was probably one of the first times where we saw some really good successes. It goes back to me about what I was saying about fragmentation when you're looking at other parts of the world, right? And then also, what you then realize is that some organizations got help, some organizations didn't get help, right? And if anything, the results haven't been consistent, okay? And it, I hope also anyone who I uh, use those benefits that were available, whether they helped you or not, I hope you go back to that first quote that I mentioned in the beginning, where I was emphasizing the point that um, if you are a leader, right, but you're expecting someone else to fix your problem, then you're already doing it wrong, okay? If anything, help comes to you because you're doing something to help yourself. That for me is the ultimate difference when you're thinking about these things, basically. So as we're thinking about that, right, um, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to um, think about, to take you back and really say, you know what, let's look at customer centricity because using the context that I've just told you now, right, which basically saying that South Africa has its strengths and it has its gaps, but at the same time, we have challenges, we also have opportunities. And also remember, I'm going into this with um, that no excuses mindset that I was talking about. Because if your first starting point is based on an excuse, then I can tell you now um, that um, you're in a situation where you're already putting blockers in your own head. It's like you're seeing the world through uh, colored glasses, right? It's like you have blinders. And this is not something that's going to help you. It's going to help you thrive. Now, the first thing that's important about customer uh, centricity, right, is this thing called 
value creation, right? And let's also talk about what do we mean when we're talking about creating value, okay? Because one of the things that's important about value is it's not so much around, um, yes, this is the product that I make, right? Ultimately, think about it. Unless you basically found the cure for cancer, whatever your business is doing, someone else out there in the world is doing exactly the same thing. And so remember, we had our, our customer here in the room, right? So there was this individual over here that I called out. So if you then say, look, with my customer sitting right here and having this conversation with me, do I actually know the, 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 the value that I'm creating for them? And I'm not talking about the story that you make up in your mind. You know, we make up the story, right? And uh, I love us South Africans. They're like, yeah, I have this idea eh, of this business. The, the world needs it now. Please, can you fund me? Please, can you help me? Please, can you uh, be successful? And I'm like, but who's the customer that wants that? Just because you believe it's needed doesn't mean that there's a customer who, who can benefit from it. Now, how do I know that something can work? How do I know that this is something that your customer can actually benefit from? Here's a fact. If no one is prepared to pay for the product at the price point that you've set it, then I'm sorry, but that's not, there's no value created. There's no customer. And so it's important to ask yourself and say, so my customer is sitting right here. What do they look like? And I'm not talking, you know, in South Africa, we love labels, right? So already you're thinking I'm going to tick the box about the, the, the race and the gender and any other boxes we're ticking today. Mm -mm. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, okay, fine. So what is it exactly that, that that customer needs to have value from about, right? Because it's important to think about the shape of the value that you bring in. Because if you cannot articulate in very few words, in literally very few words, what it is exactly that makes you different in your offering, I can tell you now, that you're not making a dent anywhere in the universe. Remember, that was Steve Jobs, right? What's the dent that you're going to be making? Now, a dent for me is your customer being able to say, this is the difference that you've brought as an individual. Now, let's also think about the other side of this, which is, OK, fine. Um, what if I already have a business, right? And I'm pretty sure my idea works. I mean, this is why I have customers. Then when I challenge you on value creation, I'll then be able to say, okay, fine, you have your customer, which is fantastic. Uh, welcome customer. But what are you making sure that you can keep them? What are you making sure? Uh, how, how are you making sure that you can keep them? How are you making sure that the value that you create for them, you know exactly what it is? Now, one of the things that I always do as an individual, is that, you know, we live in this world that says, uh, ah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, they, they, what do they say? You shouldn't, they say, you might, when, you are, when you're trying to find out what's your value, what's your difference, what's your strengths, they say, no, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Like, why should I ask people about wh what's my value, what's my strengths? And if, and, and I always push back and I always say, but once you know exactly what your value is, that's what you strengthen and that's what you build on, right? For example, I mean, let's say you are the maker, right? Of this very beautiful bottle over here that's branded, right? And you, your customers love this. I mean, they appreciate it, they enjoy it, they love interacting with it. And you keep producing more and more and more. But if you don't know exactly why, right? And let me use a very specific example. If you don't know why, why it is that this is making a difference to my customer, then you're not being client-centric. And let me be very specific. There's many elements to this, right? Um, remember I talked about, um, there's, there's this part about visible and also not visible value. The value could be beyond the product itself, right? It could be the experience that they have when they're interacting with you. It literally could be um, the, the, the tagline, the message that you have about it. It could actually just be the fact that it has a flat base and so you can balance it. It could be that they use it for many purposes that you are not even aware of after they've actually used the water that's inside, or maybe they just like the white. So my point is, if you don't investigate, but which particular part of the value for the customer is why your customer keeps coming back, I'm telling you now, let's say in this case, they like the white. Now, if you're not making sure your white uh, stays consistent, right? As you scale and it gets even whiter, guess what? Someone else will pick it up and they take over your market and they close it. That's exactly what's happened. And lastly, I talked about the ones who want to start, the ones who are successful, but I know the majority is the ones who are not successful. 
we are not successful. And maybe you're the one who's lost your customers or struggled to retain customers or get to retention later. If you are one of those individuals, then it's important to challenge yourself and then say, but what is it that I got wrong? Which part of my offering that is really valuable that I didn't give um, uh, value to, right? This is why the power of human, uh, the human connection and human brain is so important because the brain, it, it, makes up, it makes up stories, right? It really makes up stories. So if you let your brain make you believe the story that says, but I wasn't blank enough or the product wasn't blank enough, remember we all have that inferiority, that imposter syndrome, and don't even tell me that you don't have it. We all have it, right? It's just a case of finding different ways of figuring out how do I make sure that I don't let that imposter actually sit in the room, right? I don't let that imposter actually have control on my life in a way that I'm not prepared to, uh, in, a, in a way that I'm not prepared to, to let it run over, okay? So what does it mean then to also um, think about um, the customer intervention part of it, and then I'll be able to, to go into the next level of detail, is that very few organizations, right, um, think about a holistic and integrated way of their customers. I love this, right, because um, this example, because uh, because of having had the privilege, right, uh, particularly in the financial services sector, professional services sector, and also the mining um, and heavy metal sector um, in, in South Africa. When you're then um, working across these organizations, right, so helping them uh, optimize their strategy uh, uh, and we're helping them sort of optimize the implementation thereof and really reform their cultures to the next level, the way that they do it is, um, you know, when you make one part right of the business and then you leave out another part, and then you expect your organization to make it to the next level, right? It doesn't make any sense. Let me give you a very specific example because I have a background in retail I mentioned before. I actually used to work um, uh, for one of the world's biggest um, apparel retail group. They still are. I mean, the, the, that group has grown uh, year on year, year on year throughout the different crises. Um, it, it's amazing, right? Almost in 100 countries across the, the, the world. And I worked with them in Spain, I actually moved to Spain, had to learn Spanish from scratch, right? And then I traveled uh, driving innovations with them in different parts of the world. One of the things that I want to reference in the retail context is that when you're thinking about customer centricity, I mentioned this is uh, something that I used to head up when I was much younger. There's a challenge, right? And let me use a very specific example, which is the apparel context. Now, when a customer, so you understand exactly what I mean by customer centricity, when a customer um, is then walking into a conversation, walking into a store, right? Coming into your session, whatever your product is, now, in the context of retail, when the customer is coming in, they're thinking, I'm looking for an outfit, right? That's what they're thinking about. That's what's top of mind for them. And then when they walk in, what do they find, right? I mean, some of the retailers still get this wrong. So what do they find? There is the department um, of footwear. There's a department of, uh, I guess, um, and uh, the, the, the pants in this case. You've got your tees, and then you've also got your blazers on one side. Now, when I'm a customer, I'm looking for an outfit. That's all I'm looking for. Now, but what happens in the design, in the background, is that there's a brilliant team that works on footwear, a brilliant team that works on the tops, a brilliant team that, but none of them ever, hardly ever interact. I mean, the one time they interact, if there's some kind of sale where you're trying to put these products together, okay? Now, I want to use this as a very simplistic example because all of us, every single day, by the way, we wake up and we choose, how am I going to present myself today? Um, people don't think about that, but every day we choose this is the world, this is how I'm going to show myself to the world. Now, an identity as a customer in terms of that look that I was talking about, this is something that's very important. But when you then look at the reality, right, and the fact in terms of what then happens when the customer experiences your organization, huh, it's like night and day, literally night and day. They get very, very different experiences when they're interacting, depending on which part of the organization you are. And the problem with SMEs is that the founders, right, or the original team, that core team, those individuals, they're very central, right, and they do a lot of things. I mean, I know this is uh, very true. There's a good book on this. It's called The E-Myth of Entrepreneurship, and it talks about the illusion about the smaller your organization is, right, the more hats you wear, even if you don't label them, right? So what then happens is that when people are interacting with you, if they, have a, they tend to have a very different experience with that core founding team as they do when they start interacting with your other parts of the business. And the best way to avoid that is to challenge yourself and say, you know what, have I actually made sure 
that I've put the essentials of what centricity is because I'll give you an example, right? So when you, as someone who's very passionate about travel, and I'm really looking forward um, for more opportunities when we're allowed to, 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 to go out again, one of the things about traveling is you get to always experience different parts of the, the, the world, right? And whether it's in tourism, whether it's etc. And one of the things uh, that always stands out for me is just a simple experience um, when you then, um, in, the, in the tourism sector, people are always about service. But when you then interacting with the different parts of that value chain, things start breaking. And think about it, one bad experience, right? One bad experience can literally lead to the end. Right? I mean, it's literally that simple. So it's important to have those essentials in place. And let's talk about what are some of those essentials. And again, I encourage people uh, to use the chat and say, you know what? I think these are some of the essentials that I think are important. These are the things that I want to bring uh, that can be top of mind, right? I think it's really important to, to think about it from that perspective. And I'll be able to see the chat uh, feedback here as it comes through. Now, let's talk about the, the first one, right? Um, Again, remember, I spent quite a bit of time in the beginning talking about leadership. And I still think this is central. Because if you as a leader are not creating an environment where people can actually follow successfully, there's no way that people would buy in and, and follow actually a client-centric strategy. It's never going to happen, right? It's literally never going to happen. If you look at the unicorns, you know the companies that exist today, right? Uh, I did mention that I spent some time in the Valley. So I've been to your, um, you know, the, these companies that we always talk about, you know, your, your Googles, your, your Facebooks, all of these. So I've been to the, the offices, right? Really fascinating experience. But if you're looking at what they do, right, and, and how the, the organizations operate, it's not really um, the same as other parts, right? And when you're a small business, you actually have an opportunity to really shape that unique identity, right? And the, the, li literally thinking about how do I show and how do I make sure that I, I shape, because it's very hard to shape the bigger the organizations are. And so when I look at the leaders, right, I remember I was sitting with one of my peers who was um, working at Facebook, and he just started a couple of months, right, uh, before that. And I went and I was talking to him. The way he spoke about the organization, this was obviously long before Instagram, right? Now no one knows what Facebook is. Um, <laughs> and then he was literally, when he asked him about the organization and the business, you could swear it was as if he was brainwashed, just in the way that he spoke about it, in the way that he believed. It wasn't about the product. It was the impact that they were trying to have in the world, and that's how they were able to get to the scale that they were. If I compare that to my experience when I went to, to Google, for example, so, I mean, Google is just, Google is uh, fascinating what they, they've done. And I look at them and I'm saying, but how have they been, been able to stay so client-centric? Because even today, you know, a lot of us still use them as our primary source. I don't want to talk about the technology side of innovation. I'm going to skip that because that's obvious for me. But then if you start analyzing Google, right, a couple of things stood out for me and I'll, and I'll articulate them now. The first thing about their business model, right, is that they've designed the whole organization. I mean, this is now a big organization. It wasn't in the beginning. They've designed the whole organization to make sure that it operates in a way that remains and retains the essentials of, of literally uh, a, a small enterprise. Why is this important? Because we always focus on the, the difficulty of having a small business. But we're not actually realizing that if the smaller your business is, the easier it is to, be cha to change, to be agile, and to bring in new things. But then you look at how they've done it, right? So one of the things that Google is famous for, right, is they challenge the norms and they challenge the stereotypes, OK? I'm an unconformist at heart, right? I, I genuinely believe you, you need to focus on standing out, and I always do, because uh, we're all unique for a reason. So what they do to bring out that difference or that innovation is that uh, one of the things that they used to do is that everyone um, is given, I think it was like 20% of the week, to work on any innovation or any idea that they feel is important to be successful, right? Hard to do, hard to implement. Uh, but guess what? From things like that, I think things like uh, you know Gmail or some of the, the products that we use today, they would come out from innovations like that, right? I mean, they even have a separate center now where some of these secret ideas uh, are groomed. I have uh, peers that are working there, and they like uh, they can't even tell me, right, what is happening and what is being done. And I can go on and on about the environments of these unicorns, right? But 
the way that they think about innovation for me, it goes beyond the technology. One of the things they also do is make sure that in, it's actually, when you're thinking about customer centricity, it's entrenched and it's in, uh, incorporated in their strategy. Now, entrenching and incorporating to your strategy, it's not about, um, there's an easy part, right, where you can say, yes, I can measure this, I can measure the metrics, I can measure the targets, but just a simple net promoter score, I mean, how many of us actually do it, right? Do you, are you proactive enough to then say, you know what, my strategy is centrally designed on the things that my customer is asking for. Those are the things that are important, right? And then, of course, it doesn't help if you reform one thing. So it doesn't help if you say, you know what? I'm going to make sure that we're a great leadership team. I'm going to make sure that we have an exceptional strategy. All of these things work hand in hand, right? So it's important to have your processes, your people, and also your platforms, right? Work together, okay? And what the pandemic context actually showed us is the following, that it's, it's, it's literally all interlinked. So let's think about it this way. So some, a lot of businesses, they focus, okay, fine, I can optimize on the people side. I can <laughs> optimize on the processes. I'm laughing because they break, the bigger you become. Um, and then there's this pillar, though, around technology, right? And it's only coming up now that, okay, fine, because of all, a lot of us have been forced to operate in a virtual context and find different ways, people are realizing, okay, fine, I need to make sure that that's central in my processes and that I have the platforms that I need. And I guess what I'm raising is that it's important to make sure that that's not something you do because there's a crisis or because you're waiting for something. It's something that you do to get things right. And so let's focus on then, what are the, three, what are the different layers that you need to focus on? There's your team, right? Think about it. <laughs> That's the individuals that inter inter interact with your customers directly. So a happy team, a happy organization, a healthy and happy organization is the one that creates an experience for your clients that really makes a difference. Now, when you're thinking about your team, right, and stuff, I want to go beyond some of the simple things around, yes, people must be happy. But happiness, by the way, research shows, it goes beyond financial, right? People are very much uh, about alignment of purpose. Think about it. When you wake up in the morning every single day, you're focusing on, but what is my purpose? Why did I wake up? What is the thing that I want to achieve? Okay, maybe I'm the one who does that. But the thing about purpose, though, is that your body tells you, right, when you're doing something that is misaligned with your core essence and your core existence. Let me give you a very specific example. The challenge with the way we look at uh, ourselves today is we're always thinking about intelligence of the mind, right? And we forget that intelligence is actually a holistic process. There's also your, um, your heart center, right? Um, and stuff, your soul center, your mind center, except your gut center. I mean, these are all different uh, intelligence centers. So now we all have these as individuals, right? I actually, I forgot to mention that I just landed from um, a few days ago. I was in the, in the Western Cape because um, I'm a big believer in continuous learning and continuous growth. And almost every year I go on these 10-day um, um, sort of um, silent meditation courses where you're literally sitting for 10 days and you literally in silence and you just 100% focusing on um, mastery of the mind. Because what happens is when you start mastering the mind, you start accessing different parts of your intelligence. As you do that, you start realizing that when a human being is doing something that is misaligned with their purpose, the body rejects it, the guts rejects it, the heart rejects it. And so then you're in a situation where you're sitting with an employee and an individual and you're saying, but how is it that you're not performing at your best and how is it that you're not shining and you're not thriving in this? And the answer, they may never be able to articulate in the words, but it always goes back to, yeah, but this is not aligned. And so over the last year or so, we, I've been working on helping organizations develop purpose for, for many years. But last year in particular, everyone is like, now I want to get purpose. Why? Because people are sitting at home. <laughs> They're challenging themselves to say, I actually don't want to do something that I don't want to do. Why? Because we're all forced to sit still, right? And really listen to what was going on, and it really came out. So one of the things about having an, a, an, a successful and effective team is making sure that there's that, uh, that alignment in terms of your individual purpose, as an organization and being able to articulate that and finding out where are points of alignment with the individuals that are there. When there's alignment, there's more sustenance, there's more happiness, there's more consistency. And then of course, um, then when you're thinking about your, the second part, which is then the front, the middle and the back office. Remember what I was then saying earlier because I was illustrating it earlier, now look at it practically. So then 
a lot of companies then go and optimize their front office, right? And I don't want to call out anyone in particular, but we've, we, we've seen it, right? Where there's a very different experience depending on the touch points. Everyone invests in the front side. If anything, your back side of the organization is the engine, right? That's what keeps you going. That's what keeps you agile. That's what helps you be successful, right? Of course. And then, of course, there's your channels and your partners, right? And being able to find out, okay, especially if I'm a smaller organization, I can't do everything. I can't be strong at everything. So how do I make sure that I fill the different gaps, right? And then, of course, there's the other parts around your, your market dynamics, right? Why are these important? So... You should always be centered in sort of understanding the, 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 the value that you, you're bringing and your difference. But I mentioned that we, we're living in a very globally connected world. And so there's these signals that come through, right? I'm talking about dynamics in different parts of the world and different, part, different markets, right? What are you doing to make sure that you're keeping up to speed with those? That you're reforming, right? Because, again... The, the failure rate of small organization is very high. I mean, especially in the first few year, couple of years, 90% of organizations don't make it. It, it keeps reducing, right, and stuff. And so uh, challenge yourself and ask yourself and say, okay, fine, what am I doing to watch out for signals and which signals do I look for? And also, please, no, no fake signals. There's nothing that frustrates me more with the, the thing what's happening today. You know, everyone is an expert because they uh, read a Twitter post, right? And it doesn't work that way. So challenging yourself to say, what are the signals that uh, impacts my organization, but also what are the signals that matter most to my customer? And where is my customer, right? Especially in this digital context and, uh, and what the, they look like. Now, speaking of the digital context, right? I'm gonna come to it now because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure people are saying, yeah, but I could have had a business. I could have had a business. My business would have survived, but it sort of didn't because, um, you know, digital came. All of a sudden, I had to uh, learn to, 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 to touch or interact with things that uh, I never had to do before, right? Um, and also, the main thing is that um, I, I'm also realizing it now. I'm just reading the chat. Um, there's someone, Untabi Singh, Manye. She says, you know, this thing around, there's so much difference. There's so much different help, the thing that I was saying before. So many different incubators, but nobody grows. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've never used a, a single one, right? Because I, I, I wanted to see what happens, what happens when you break the rules. I, I like to break the rules, and it works every time, okay? Because it's led to success. Um, and so let me talk about the digital uh, and customer experience, right? And where that comes in. And the first, there's, a, there's a couple of things here, right? Um, and we'll go through it um, in the conversation as we, as we carry on. So the first thing about the digital context is there's, there's people who sort of closed off their minds. I mean, some people are literally still recovering. They closed off their minds instead of saying, what are the different tools, what are the different platforms, what are the different ways to make sure that I can be successful, right? I mean, if I tell you right now that, you know, even just being able to communicate with my, my customers, the number of screens I have in my studio um, at, at home, right? And the amount of devices and the technology that we've all had to invest in to be able to deliver the best quality service to our customers, it's, it's, it's on another level, right? But... The, f the biggest thing and most important thing, right, in terms of digitizing your customer experience is that you need to make sure that you invest in that SOE, SEO platforms, right? This is very, very important. This is now basic, but a lot of people over the last year or so got the wake-up call, still didn't action it. And then how are people going to find out about you if they're not reading the newspaper, right? Or if they're not seeing the billboard or if they're not able to interact with you at a, at a, at a conference, right, uh, in person, so what are the things that you're doing to make sure that we can actually find you? Because even me, I would like to interact with your product, assuming I'm your, your customer. The second thing is about discovery, right? So what is the experience? I mean, a customer goes through a journey, right? I love the videos that I saw um, online um, when people were bored at home. And so they started creating these videos of, you know, this is your experience when you, like, they were, a lot of them are from the uh, retail sector where they experience at Woolworths, experience at Pick and Pay, experience at, uh, you know, uh, ShopRite, et cetera, et cetera. And they make a joke about it, right? But the moral of the story is that um, what are you doing to make sure that your customer discovers you? 
because ultimately a lot of people say, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure I'm a social media person. That's not the point, right? I mean, social media is not the only way to reach your customer. But it's important to find out what are different channels that you can get to, but also what are you doing to create an experience that's very different, right? Um, is it and then also differentiation. And remember, I talked about value creation. Our customer is over here. Um, and our customer is saying, what makes you different? So if your source of difference for example, was relying on the fact that I really need to interact with you in person for that difference to succeed, it's possible to reform that and that's okay. There's different ways of making sure that you can reform that. There's also the conversion part, right? And remember what I said about, you know, sitting on millions and millions of customer data and not doing anything about it. That's a mistake that a lot of organizations make. And so it's very important then to think about, okay, fine, but am I really converting customers? I had a, 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 a small business owner recently, very, very small business. They're really starting out and they're really asking me and they're saying, yeah, but uh, why should I be analyzing my customers? And I said to them, yeah, but do you know where your leads come from, right? Yeah, well, I'm not sure, but, but, but ultimately, and when I'm saying where they come from, which platform is giving you people or is giving you more customers? Which individual is giving you the biggest referrals? I mean, if you have someone who's giving 50% of the referrals or 20% of the referrals of your organization, that person becomes a VIP, right? I mean, they get a discount tomorrow. So what are these things that you're doing to convert your customers, to convert your clients, right? And really think of different ways of engaging them. Because engagement is not just about, I made a post, right? Are you meeting them where you, uh, they are? Are you understanding what are some of the needs that they have? And are you also uh, leveraging them, right, to get, to get to the other side? If you can just get the other couple of steps right, then it's much easier to get to the rest, which is being able to give them support, being able to get them to come and actually really buy again. But I just think if you don't have that chain right, and I myself have made a lot of mistakes, but I'm very happy to make mistakes because that's how we learn, right? I mean, every year I always say, my organization is different because it's an experiment. I mean, that's what you do. If you build something, you're experimenting. And so every year you experiment, things get break. Your conversion model doesn't work, right? Your, your awareness campaign doesn't succeed, right? Um, the customers you wanted to buy again, they don't come back, right? Whereas um, if you then push yourself and you say, but what's my difference and what's that thing that I'm bringing? That's when you start seeing the difference, right? And that's what this is about. And so let me push you on repeat sales because one of the things that the pandemic showed a lot of companies and myself included, your most valuable customers are the ones that keep coming back. And you know who they are because we always ignore them, right? We get excited about the next new exciting opportunity um, and stuff. I mean, if your customer here is Untabi Singh, right? And Untabi Singh has been very loyal for, for 15 years um, and stuff. And then uh, next thing you know, uh, next thing you know, uh, there's Emmanuel over there. And Emmanuel comes in with all these demands. Next thing you know, you're dropping. You're dropping in Tabi Singh. You're focusing on Emmanuel. Emmanuel is gone after one sale, disappear, right? And you're thinking, Tabi Singh has been servicing your organization for many years. Tabi Singh has given you all these referrals, but you are getting bored instead of saying, but why is Tabi Singh keeps coming back? And what is the value that she's actually been able to bring to me? So that's what it means, right? When you're thinking about how do I create that repeat cycle? Because then your loyal customers are the ones that give you the biggest bounce back. So for, for, let me give you an example. So for me, as soon as the, the pandemic affected all of us, my immediate action, definitely reform, definitely uh, agility, completely revamping uh, the business model because well, I use it as an opportunity. So one month after the, 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 the lockdown or the impact in South Africa, I was went and I sat in front of uh, CEOs, right? Clients that I've worked for years that have been loyal before, who'd canceled everything. I mean, they'd canceled everything. I said to them, this is how I think I can solve your problems in a way that's different and that's innovative. They were the first to say, yes, show me how you can do it. And we've been partnering with them consistently throughout and will continue to. And why did they say yes, right? First of all, because there's a, that thing of investing in uh, the quality of your repeat relationships. So those leadership teams, right, those individuals, those executive teams, when I'm sitting there and I'm saying, look, let's have a conversation, because they know the value of the quality that they, we bring, right, they're also curious to say, so tell me so I can learn and help me grow because as a leader, I'm not sure I know what's going on. Now, that's what I'm passionate about and what I bring. Now, in what you bring and what you offer, you need to challenge yourself to do the same thing. And literally, uh, think about the different areas, right? And it's a channel, it's a, it's a funnel, this thing, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But th really thinking about what is that unique selling point? And I'm not talking about Emmanuel over here, because Emmanuel just came, Jay, you know? I, I want to talk about Ntabi Singh, right? Ntabi Singh is thinking, but there's something unique, right? 
You need to own it, you need to hone it, as I mentioned in the beginning. And then, of course, what are your marketing practices aligned with that and bringing it to life? That's another thing that's very, very important and that's very critical. And then, of course, are you then um, converting the prospects, right? This is very, very important because they come through because of the channels that you make. And then, of course, um, are you then putting in systems in place to then make these processes automatic? It's very hard. I know I struggled a lot to, to make uh, processes automatic because you get excited, you know? You want to keep moving, you want to keep going, but if you don't get this part right, that's what affects your survival. And then, of course, last but not least, are you in creating an environment that actually sustains uh, the system, right? And sustainability is, is not, um, you know, in the, in the classic context, but when you're thinking about sustainability, you're challenging yourself to then say, okay, fine, but it, it, not the product, because think about what sustains the product. Is your team operating in a sustainable way? And let's be honest, right? So there's a reason why things like uh, mental health uh, and mental wellness, right, became a big, big, big topic. Uh, because of the pressure individuals have been in and everything that's happened in the last couple of months, it's come up to the top. And, and the organizations who were not, who didn't have measures in place, right, to ensure that individuals can actually sustain themselves were really affected by it. And it had a big impact. Now, that's just on the wellness side, right? Now, translate and actually go to the other side, which is then saying, but are you making sure that you are sustaining yourself? Because let's be honest, right? If, you, if any of you founded, built, leading, um, you know, scaling an organization right now, if you could not sustain yourself as an individual, there's no ways that anything that you oversee, that you build, will actually be sustainable. And sustainability is a very important thing because, it, 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 you know, we, 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 uh, we like cars in South Africa, nice cars, fancy cars. I see them here on the road, right? Um, but under no circumstances does anyone, you know, take out this fancy car when it doesn't have the fuel. And let's hope no one uh, takes it for a long drive when it's on the reserve tank. I mean, what do you do? You go and you fill it up, right? And um, you make sure you don't miss your service, hey? And there's all these things that you do because you know that's how a car operates, okay? Another example. We attach to these, uh, there's these small devices uh, that we call cell phones. And I still hope in 100 years from now, people will watch videos of us. Um, you know, completely 24-7 on these things and be like, what was it and what was wrong with you guys? So these things that we attach to, right, um, we know they run on uh, battery. And so we go mad, right? We go mad, we go absolutely mad as soon as we start seeing that the batteries are running out. I mean, um, we talk about uh, not feeling safe ne, in South Africa, so people would be, but if your phone is like running out in, in um, a battery and you're in somewhere, in anywhere in South Africa, it's a coffee shop, a restaurant, all of a sudden you're like, I trust you, please take my phone because I need this to work. Why do we panic? It's because we know we need them for sustenance. We know we need them for sustenance. But... When it comes to ourselves, right, about sustaining ourselves, I mean, what sustains a human body, right? There's a certain amount of sleep, there's a certain amount of food, there's a certain amount of energy, right? Where do you get your energy and what are you doing to restore your energy? You know, uh, the community. I mean, we social beings, we thrive when we're interconnected with others. And so creating an environment of sustainability is about making sure that you sustain yourself, right? We don't do that very well. And as a result, it has a really significant impact in terms of our, in terms of our ability to, to continue. And I'll be honest, I mean, scaling an organization is very difficult. I mean, it's not for the, um, it's not for the, for the weak at heart, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes, a Latin one, if you translate it in English, it says, fortune uh, favors the brave. It's about bravery, but you cannot be brave if you're running your car on reserve, right? Or if it's not serviced properly. But also, more importantly, leveraging, um, you know, the th really the different ways and the different ways of thinking around, um, around making sure that you're being holistic in the way that you do it. And then the last part that I, I want to get to is uh, then thinking about uh, this piece around uh, establishing strategic partnerships, right? And why are strategic partnerships important, right? Um, is that if you don't partner as a small organization, right, if you don't make that investment to really think about what are the different ways for me to, to partner with others, right, and you're trying to achieve and develop everything yourself, then success won't come, right? And I think that's the impact. 
And so I encourage you to then think about who are the partners that I need to have, right? Who are the partners that I need to make sure that I partner with so I can be successful, basically. Because if you're not partnering with anyone, you'll only be as good as your, you know, they say, do you want to be a, what is it, a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? When you're a small fish in a big pond, we all get to share, we all get to collaborate. You will never be good at everything. But it's important to, similar to what I was saying, where you work with individuals who are aligned with your purpose and your customers are aligned to that and you're very clear, as to the value that you create. It's the same thing with your strategic partnerships. You really need to think about what are the different things that m m complete the gaps. I mean, this is why synergy is such uh, a, big, uh, a big buzzword. And I'll also leave you with my own, um, with my own um, you know, personal pers pers statement that I invested a lot in honing in the last, um, the last year or so. But it's important that at any touch point, right, and in, in any context that people interact with you, who you are in your essence, right, because again, what does it mean to be centric to your true identity as an individual, as an organization, et cetera, is being able to, people experience who you are and what you are before you even say anything, right? The same thing when I was saying about the product. It's not something that you say, it's an experience, right? And for me, this thing around optimism and just really being grounded, right? Um, is important because that's a way that you can really find and make sure that you inspire people to really reconnect uh, with themselves and really thrive and succeed in different ways so that they can really achieve um, an impact. That's the part that is important to me, right? But challenge yourself to then say, you know what? If I want to put my customer first, what is that experience that I want them to have? So that they too can feel like, you know what? This business exists to achieve an, a purpose that's far bigger than the product itself. That's what creates uh, sustainability and also alignment. Um, and so I hope um, that helped in terms of getting some of the insights and some of the perspectives uh, for this conversation. And I'm also just looking um, you know, in some of the comments and some of the chat just to answer some of the questions that came through. You can see that um, someone was asking this thing around, um, but are you sure? Are you sure you should be uh, running surveys? Of course you run surveys. You need to talk to your customers. You need to hear from your customers. So I really hope that you took something about being client-centric, understanding what your role is uh, as a leader. And by the way, everyone is a leader. Hey, you can't say, but me, I'm not leading anyone. No, you're leading yourself. And so whatever role you play in your organization, it's important to realize that your organization succeeds because you put yourself first and you do things right. The fact that you showed up today to be part of this powerful conference and gathering is already saying, look, I'm hungry. I want to learn. I want to take something. And so I encourage you, uh, as I wrap up, I encourage you to also then say, uh, let me find out. Let me think about what it is. But if you do have any further questions or any comments um, that you'd like to share, please feel free to reach out any um, on the social media platforms. I'm happy to interact. I'm happy to in engage. And again, my name is Zipo Sikakane. And thank you so much for having me. Really, really appreciate it.